mean, I remember when uh, we were signed to CBS, uh, we were signed to uh, with a couple of different people. And uh, after we left, and we they had they, I had Dre and Q both signed to CBS. They dropped us a year later, and then once they blew up, hey man, did you uh, get the fuck out of here with that bullshit? I yeah. hate that yeah. shit, man. Because most of the people in the record industry and positions don't have no ears. Okay, they only want to hear was already out there. They have no innovation when it comes to trying to hear something new, set the new trend. They all they want you to do is deliver what somebody else has already got a hit record on. Okay, right. this is one reason why I say why we have the uh, the the, uh, the drought of music we have right now. Everything sounds alike because everybody wants to do what everybody else is doing. Nobody wants to be different and step into their own lane or come with something a little bit more. Correct. As soon as somebody do the whole thing, yes. They're going to follow that person, okay? So it, it, it's, it's really frustrating, man. Do you think Do you think if today's artists, people, if, if consumers had to come in today's, had to buy today's records the same way they did back in the day, get in the car, catch the bus, reach in their pocket, and put money on the, on the, on the, on the counter, to buy a particular single or album, do you think the artist of today would be as, as, as successful um, in that climate? That's a good question. Uh, some of them, some of them would uh, definitely. Some of them would, uh, you know, because see, this is a always. I used to hear this stuff back in the day where you know the record company would do something dramatic like a, a, a format change or whatever and stuff like that and they'll say that you know the consumer drive the industry no this consumer don't drive the industry the industry drive the consumer because you know i look back at you know when we were selling a tracks uh we didn't the people didn't stop buying a tracks uh the record company stopped making them and so the consumer had to move to the next format which was the cassette and stuff. People didn't stop buying cassettes as soon as the label stopped making them. So then they had to start buying CDs and stuff like that. So it's always uh, uh, the consumer will gravitate to what's available to them, you know, at that time. So I look at, you know, even today, uh, I still get quite a few um, requests for like physical um, uh, CDs uh, on, on like some of the major artists that's out today. Uh, but, you know, I tell them that, you know, you, they kind of have to go online and download it from iTunes or one or the other because there's you no know, physical uh, product on it. Uh, but, you know, I've always said that the, the industry has always been driven by, you know, the companies and the manufacturers. It ain't driven by the consumer. Because whatever is uh, 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 made and marketed and promoted the right way, people will gravitate to it. I got a guy right now bugging me for uh, two CDs, uh, one of uh, World Class and one is wrapped in, on Wrapped in Romance. Neither one of them were ever made on CD, but I was able to get them converted to a CD. And he just, he wants a CDR of these two songs. For some reason, there's something about these two albums. He's hit me up multiple emails. He wants a CDR. Man, I can, you can get it on that. No, I don't want to download it. I want it on the CDR. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to cut him a deal. It's going to cost him, but I'm, I'm going to make yeah. it for him. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I got a personal question for you. Of all the music formats you ever dealt with, cassette, eight track CDs, 12 inches, which one do you think was, 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 the, was the most interesting to deal with? Uh, the, the, uh, the LP. Why is that? The vinyl. I don't know. I mean, that was just so much a part of uh, uh, our development and, you know, our history. Well, we used to be on 28th and Crenshaw, which a lot of people think VIP Long Beach was like the only VIP record store. VIP Long Beach was like VIP number eight or something. Yeah. It was like L.A. We had a store in Pasadena for a while, but... The store on 28th and Crenshaw was the best VIP store ever because uh, 
Uh, it was huge. Uh, huh? Huge. Huh? It was huge. Well, it was it was, it was pretty good size, but it was definitely for the for the flow of business that we did there, and and the amount of product and music that we sold. We 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 sold so many albums, so we couldn't even put them on the rack on the wall. We just have them line up in the down the center of the store. We just yeah. take them out the box and flip the box over and set them on top because yeah. records was going that fast. And uh, you know, we had celebrity um customers and stuff, you know, uh the soul train dancers used to come down. We got athletes that used to come there. I remember uh Red Fox used to come there and he would come and buy like a box of albums and he would say uh, can you take this out to my car, young fella, and stuff? And I would <laughs> take him out to his Rolls Royce, and he'd give me ten dollar tip or something. But man, it was just uh, amazing during that period of time and stuff. I remember uh, when when I look at some of the projects that I've sold over the years, it, it's amazing uh, how this one particular album always sticks in my mind and stuff. And it was. Uh, the Key Sweat album, the Make It Last Forever album. Okay. What was so remarkable about that album uh, is that they would release a, a, another song off the album every like three months or something like that. And so uh, people would come in and they would like ask for the new Key Sweat album. And I was like, uh, you don't have a new album out. And so, you know, they would sing us some of the songs. I said, oh, that's on the other side of the album. Yeah. It, was, it was just funny how that album stayed in our top 10 for a year because they strategically released songs off of it. And, you know, that was one of the things that problems that I had with labels and stuff. They wouldn't go deep enough into the album before they would move on to the next thing, man. It was a lot of projects that didn't do what they should have did because uh, after a single or two, you know, I'm like, you'll spend all of these months recording a record and stuff, but you're going to, as a company, you can only focus on two cuts. Man, that didn't make no sense to me. You fact. know, I, I tell the story sometime. Uh, I used to do a lot of business with K-Ace. And uh, when they, when uh, uh, Alonzo Miller, I think his name was, brought in uh, the Tina Marie album, I was in the studio talking to Easy Wiggins at K.H. Okay. Down, in, down in Watts. And he, the, he played the album. I guess he got it earlier. But he played the whole album. And he yeah. got a call from Jesus Garber, the, the promoter. Man, you can't do that. You're going to get me in trouble. He said, man, this is a badass album. Why well, can't play it? And he got this all of a sudden Willie Davis came in to jump on him. And I'm like, Come, this, I, I never understood that. You got an album with a solid-ass album but you only want people to focus on one or two songs. I don't understand that. I never understood that. Yeah, it made, made no sense to me and stuff. And one of the other things that record company used to kill me on and stuff, especially when it come down to re reporting to Billboard back then and then with the sound scan and stuff like that, how important it was for a record to debut in the top 10. And so, well, it was explained to me later on and stuff like that because they said that, you know, when you record come out in the top 10 and stuff, uh, you got uh, places and, and, and countries and radios, they attention, they, they pay a lot of attention to that. And, it, and what it does is that, you know, it helps promote the artists and stuff. Uh, uh, people buy purchase from the billboard chart and stuff. I mean, you got Japan, you got Germany, a lot of these other countries. If it's in the top 10, then they should have it. You know? right. So it, it had a lot to do with the, getting your product into the marketplace. But my thing was, you know, if, if your record debut number one on the chart, you don't have one way to go. <laughs> That's down. Right. And so, me, I would rather for my project to debut in the top 25 and work its way up to number one. Yeah, right. Debut number one, because it ain't but one place to go. But it, it was amazing how, you know, so much focus was being put on 
top 10 release, you know, on, on release week, you know, they want, everybody want to be number one on release week. But it, to me, it, it, it didn't make a lot of sense that, you know, you want long jeopardy in your project, not, you know, for it to come out at the top and then it's it only one way for it to go and put it down. But, you know, it was just funny how, how the industry, you know, worked and, and operated. 